All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome to Skype session number nine. Um, to, before we actually start talking about the article for today, um, the point of these Skype sessions is just to um, innovate and be able to hear um, others' perspectives on things that are happening in the social impact space. So um, thank you all for being here today. And um, we are Impaction, and we're here to talk about this new idea that's going on in the social impact space. So um, if everyone could introduce yourself in two sentences or less, that would be great. I will start. I'm Shivani. I'm one of the co-founders of Impaction, and I'm based here in Chicago. Um, Sukanya, you want to go next? Hi, everyone. I'm Sukanya. I'm a graduate student at New York Institute of Technology. Majoring in Human Resource Management and Labor Relations. Tami, you want to go next? Hi, guys. I'm Tanvi. I am a product manager with Impaction, and I am based for Trenton, New Jersey. Meghna? Um, hi, I'm Meghna. I'm the UX UI designer for Impaction, and I'm based in Washington, D.C. Uh, Tami, do you want to go next? I'm Samira Khan. I work at Salesforce right now, but previously I was a social impact consultant and I apologize about the noise. I'm uh, Divya, you want to go next? Sure. Hello, my name is Divya. I work at the intersection of public health and health, and uh, I'm based out of DC. Great, thank you. Chetan, how about you? Yes. I'm Chetan. I'm from India, and I work for an organization called Kuhn. Thank you. Thanks. And then Samer, you want to go next? Sure. I'm um, Samer Yusuf, uh, based in Western Massachusetts, and I work. I'm a program associate for VentureWell, which works with early stage entrepreneurs to help them get the support financing they need. Great. Thank you, Ruth. How about you? Sure. And. I'll turn my video on for this part too. Hi, I'm Ruth. Um, I'm based in Washington, D.C., and I recently founded an organization called AmeriExchange, which is seeking to bridge urban and rural divides, specifically with college students through educational and training programs. All right. And then last but not least, Puya. Hi. Um... Sorry, guys, my, I'm having technical issues. Uh, I'm Puya, based in Washington, D.C., uh, social enterprise called NishTube, where we're trying to help folks uh, capture and preserve their kitchen's history. Um, and also, I'm going to put a quick plug. I have a NGO, friends of mine in northern Greece, helping unaccompanied minors needing educational resources. So if anybody's got ideas at the end, love to go ahead and hear from you. Great. Thank you so much. All right, let's jump right in. Um, so I'm going to be sharing my screen, um, but we are going to be discussing um, Samira Khan's article, Big Ideas 2019, um, Five Big Ideas and Social Impact. So this article talks about five important ideas that Samira states will shape the social impact space in the coming year. Um, these five ideas include the growing roles of impact currency, behavioral science, youth-led movements, social impact and corporate policies, and female-led initiatives in both for-profit and nonprofit spaces. Um, here at Impaction, we're particularly interested in the role of social impact initiatives in the for-profit space, so we will be focusing on uh, Samira's first big idea and how um, impact trailblazers will be thinking not only in terms of the impact economy, but how much impact currency they hold and to what extent they can trade on impact, which is the exact first point we see here. Um, this takes the movement from theory to action um, and might even offer a more inclusive lens into the innovation space moving forward. So I'm going to mute myself and stop talking and um, anyone can come forward and start the conversation. Okay, I'll go. So yeah, there had which is a lot of not many times misunderstood nor or not clearly understood. And in the first point, uh, 
specifically, um, what I found interesting was this article from uh, the, uh, the McKinsey article, and they talk a lot about uh, social return on investments and what a role a mature impact economy would play in the impact space. So I would really like to hear a little bit more about this uh, from Samira, like her thoughts about it um, and what made her think that this would be the next big thing in 2019. Yeah, so I, again, I apologize about the noise. Um, I can't speak to the McKinsey article itself. I haven't spoken to the sort of you know, the authors behind it. But in general, the idea is that there are a number of different ways in which investors for profits and to some extent not for profits are trying to better articulate and their impact in quantitative terms. So in order to do so, they're using a number of different frameworks. You know, at the highest level, you have the SDGs and organizations are trying to figure out how their work maps to the SDGs and how they can articulate progress against it. There are organizations like the GIN um, that specifically work in the social impact investing or impact investing space. There's others like IATI. The Good Guide in the U.S. Um, uh, sorry, GuideStar in the U.S. has its own set of guidelines. So there's a number of different organizations that are trying to, for lack of better words, codify or standardize impact. And what this impact currency topic really is about is how do you take that codification and make it more standard across different industries, across different players, across different sectors to articulate impact against the same goals. So one thing we've noticed is that even if the frameworks are a little bit different and the standards are different, the themes tend to be similar. So how can we use you know, the data that underlies them as well as the expertise of different organizations to standardize them? And then when organizations articulate their impact, how could we potentially assign a score to them or assign some sort of a metric that allows investors and others to be able to compare and rank or rate um, impact and social impact oriented organizations? And the way I sort of think about it is, you know, it would first obviously be implemented in very well researched organizations um, that tend to be slower moving and then come to the social enterprise space just because social enterprises are dealing with some core operational and social issues and they don't necessarily have time to invest into sort of impact measurement, but there might be some forward looking ones who are doing so. So I would love to hear from you guys either during the reflection period or otherwise, to what extent you see social entrepreneurs measuring their impact and whether or not they would be able to play in an impact economy like this because I could be totally wrong. It could start bottoms up as well. I hope that answers your question. Yes, yeah, certainly it does. Thank you. Like the entire article, uh, even yours and the McKinsey article is very insightful about how um, the impact space could potentially really develop with leaps and bounds because of as you said, quantifying or standardizing the impact currency or the impact economy. So yeah, uh, does anyone else want to share their opinions about this? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I was actually thinking about how logistically you would codify something. I mean, I think I used to work in uh, global health, and so we flew a lot. And that's so many negative climate points for you. And so logistically, if you're looking at a, an organization that's in global health and you're looking at their impact, yes, they're, you know, they're doing malaria nets and, and you know, I was working with HIV. How, how, how do you, um, can, how far would it go? Uh, are we thinking, or, or have there been frameworks that have kind of included, this is your climate impact as an organization, and then we're also going to look at the actual work that you do. And, and how do you balance those? Because um, I think I think about one, the different sectors of impact and each organization is not in and of itself a vacuum, right? I think it's necessary that we need some sort of standardization so that we can say, okay, if you buy shoes and someone gives someone else a pair of shoes, that's great. But then what are kind of the negative points that they get for the um, supply chain that possibly wasn't thought about? 
So logistically, those are my kinds of initial thoughts of the challenges that would have to be overcome um, to standardize something um, that's so that's so big. I think also if I can throw out there that getting something standardized standardized across any particular sector is already really hard. Um, I feel like that's a big challenge in whatever sector, whether it's global health or, you know, um, more scientific research or, you know, any any sort of specific sector that you can think of will have its own standards and getting those standards uh, to be accepted by the entire industry is difficult enough. And this seems like it would be something that we would want to extend across sectors. So I feel like the challenge would be even greater um, if you're asking people to start standardizing uh, the same way of measuring impact across different sectors. And, and whether that would even work also, I think, you know, like, we were, like the point that was just brought up, like the way that you might measure impact in one sector might be different than the way that you would measure impact in a different sector. So I think those are two challenges that are that would be interesting. I, can I may I share a thought? This is Puya. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So I, I've worked quite a with a, quite a few refugee populations, and well, it's interesting from the bottom up or top down. On the bottom up side, there's certainly a lot of skills and. and uh, resources and, and obviously uh, wants and, and, and wherewithal, just a matter of not having the, uh, the the platform or way to go ahead and contribute. So it always, as a, as a scrum master, always think about if you did a, uh, a use case model where you can capture basically the need and build um, you know up to it. And one thing that I wrote a while back was like, for example, mine's more, uh, you know, the, I, the thing is, Migration, forced or otherwise, decouples families. So my goal is utilizing food as a way to make them whole again. But really, like the bigger picture is um, helping feed a family while you help them learn, while people learn from their culture. And that's kind of that food, you know, foodiepreneur model. So um, it's interesting because I think the the the, the hard part is, is literally capturing the needs at a ground level and and trying to build up for it. It's it's, again, it's an opinion, just an observation only. Thank you. I guess, uh, I mean, I, I, I think I am also like leaning towards that. I mean, there in the Wall Street Journal article, um, like it said something about how there were 150 ways um, on how to measure social and environmental improvement. And I think I mean, it, I think it also mentioned that, that social enterprises um, have been trying to measure and standardize impact for a long time. But I guess my question is, is that is defining what social impact is necessary? Um, it, I mean, it's helpful to have a standardized metric um, that all social impact organizations uh, may may be able to turn to. But at the end of the day, are we so caught up in defining what social impact is and is that taking away from the actual goals or taking away from the actual actions that we're contributing to the space? Exactly um, right. Sure. Yeah. Exactly right. So I, I think it, I would lean to that it might be necessary to guide um, only because it, oh, is someone else trying to speak? Am I speaking over someone? Okay, sorry, that's just me then. Um, I um I was I I think it might be necessary just because there's a lot of companies that don't really know if they, they kind of tag on a social impact mission without thinking too much about it. Um and it 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 they use it in their marketing irresponsibly and that detracts from real missions with real people doing real work. So I think that's the upside uh, of, of having something where, you know, something like the Better Business Bureau, they give you rankings or Charity Navigator or things like that. They kind of help 
consumers, um, investors, donators, whoever, whoever your target audience is, understand that you've got some sort of seal of approval from somebody. There are downsides to all of those things, but um, I think the solution that this, you know, codification could be trying to solve is trying to take out the bad actors, which, you know, most standardization tries to solve. And we've, we've seen examples of it working at least somewhat, you know, for instance, I'm thinking right now of fair trade. That wasn't even something that people really thought about just 10, 20 years ago. And now, you know, you go into most stores, especially health food stores, and you can see the label. And a lot of people base their shopping now off of whether or not they see that fair trade label. So if we had something similar for impact where you would have um, like an impact sticker with sort of your ranking as to how you were doing. Um, but yeah, that would again mean codifying and having something that that ranking would be based off of that would be standardized across industries. Kind of building off of that, and uh, Ruth, you may have been the one that mentioned it earlier, but um, with the fair trade coffee example, it's effective because it's so specialized. Right, and it's something for easily for people to digest and understand and evaluate. And uh, I think trying to codify something that's so generalized as just having impact um, may kind of just like it defines so many things that it doesn't define anything in the end. Um, so it's like maybe the way to go is focusing on industries, and that at that level you can have pretty quantitatively measured like metrics that you can, you know, you can like evaluate. Um, rather than trying to find a, a solution that kind of fits a lot of different And to that point, what is what is the reason or rationale? Like, why would I need to scale to a standard of a big corporation social impact, which is kind of part of their PR phase, where you know our my effort, for example, is not about PR and it's about you know at a, at a, at a, at a grassroots level. But what? Why would I need to, you know, abide by a standardization that, you know, they they abide to because it's, you know, through their bottom line dollar and a certain money they put aside that doesn't matter if they make a profit or not. Any thoughts? So I just wanted to add um, a few thoughts on some of the things you said. Uh, first, to address the last point with regards to standardizing against uh, sort of a corporate fixed standard. So I should have actually prefaced this by saying any views on the impact currency do not represent Salesforce. They're actually my professional views from like over time working with social impact organizations. I cannot speak on behalf of let's say Salesforce. So I just wanted to clarify that piece. Um, the idea behind sort of the impact economy and impact currency would be that these standards would be defined um, in a collaborative way with social enterprises, with impact investors, you know, really taking players across the board would have to collaborate on something like this. So it certainly wouldn't be a corporate led sort of standard thing that that said, obviously, foundations, corporations have deep pockets and in order to secure or garner their resources, their investments, um, which nonprofits are often doing, what you know is anticipated or what I anticipate is that more and more of these organizations will need to speak the value or the return on investment language of the foundations. And they're already trying to do it of the corporations in order to compete for those dollars. So I wouldn't say it would be a policy and one would have to, but there might be pressure. It's more about the pressure to do so. Um, some other great points that came up were around uh, how hard it is to measure impact in an outcomes focused <laughs> way, even within one sector, as opposed to across one sector. And that is absolutely on point. I've worked with a number of different foundations that have struggled just within their own organization on three key themes in terms of measuring their outcomes. It's always sort of starting with outputs because they don't have the data. They don't have the resources to put behind the data. The data is messy. So even in well-endowed foundations, this happened. But there are alternative ways, um, which I think were alluded to in this conversation by taking like beneficiary focused information, such as reviews. There are many review sites that exist. What if we had beneficiaries reviewing various services? Um, what if efficiency was used as a metric? So there's some more generalized metrics that could be used, but obviously 
a currency wouldn't be complete then in capturing value. But if you look at our sort of economic currency, I would argue our economic currency or money is not a complete way to measure value anyway. So it's just adding to that another incomplete yet additive way of measuring impact, if that makes any sense. And the final two points is, um, one is around narratives. So there are people out there and organizations out there trying to make sense of impact narratives and kind of map narratives of beneficiaries of other organizations and derive some sort of value from that. So it's not just um, a lot of deep sort of qualitative analysis or controlled experiments. There's other sort of innovative methods people are trying to use that may contribute to the rise of this currency. Um, and then the last point I would I just wanted to add is, you know, even if it doesn't get to the point of currency, somebody mentioned labels, just the idea of being more transparent about impact um, would be a great first step, even if we never got to sort of the currency level. I feel one of the biggest milestone in the social impact space would be getting youth involved and having youth-led social impact initiatives. I feel a lot of students and youngsters are nowadays getting involved in the social impact space by working for their own cause and by starting their own organizations. And when corporates come forward to provide them with resources by mentoring them, it helps them in achieving their goal further. I strongly believe in this youth-led initiative and corporates should come forward to support them. I would see this this would be more successful if it's done as a part of the CSR strategy. I would like to know what is your people opinion about that. Sorry, that's a, okay, that's for me, I guess. Sorry. Um so you're saying basically the idea of incorporating more youth led or young you know, younger generation led initiatives into cor corporate social responsibility or that's not a good word anymore, is social impact strategies. So that's absolutely on the table. I think a lot of organizations already try to do it. A lot of corporations already try to do it, do it in terms of holding innovation competitions and innovation prizes or starting to better, for lack of better words, um, better cross pollinate and educate, you know, around social impact. So you have professionals educating younger you know generations social entrepreneurs educating those in the corporate sector so i i do think there's a role for corporates to play but i think there is so much to be learned by social entrepreneurs and their sort of appetite the challenges they face the lessons they learn i mean i think the risk and sort of the enthusiasm and passion that exists um among you know people today that didn't exist 20 years ago is is amazing and needs to be harnessed so it's really a two-way street in terms of learning but corporations certainly are thinking about it because it's it's oftentimes a part of their talent strategy that's how they are getting talent these days retaining talent more and more you know people are caring about it so it's definitely on the table but it def it should be a two-way street or two-way sort of learning conversation I completely agree with what Samira said. I think I could be the best example over here. I started my organization back uh, when I was 15 years old and now I'm 18 and it's been three years since the organization is up and running. In the initial days, it was very tough. Uh, I started it due to uh, the enthusiasm and Josh and the need for doing it for something which I had experienced personally. and Today, last year we got into CSR and uh, we have been mentored by two companies till date and recently we also got into an incubation by the US consulate over here in India and it plays a very huge role in how uh, youth led initiatives can turn into potential organization creating large scale impact with the help of corporates providing them uh, training or uh, other um, technicalities and support. So I think it's already uh, becoming a trend of corporate supporting youth led initiatives and it should go on so that the impact created in the entire system uh, is there for a longer run. Yeah, I do think there is more opportunity to formalize this sort of mentorship relationship so it doesn't sit outside 
and like as some sort of side project you do once a year rather it becomes an ongoing deeper relationship between you know social enterprises and corporates across generations sort of formalizing the the mentor mentor she mentor mentee relationship as something that is necessary for social impact to move forward i think is um it, it needs to take place it shouldn't just be sort of a side thing so that there's definitely a lot of work to be done in, in that realm I actually had a question about um, like the inclusive nature of impact metrics. I mean, like right now, um, like in, in previously we saw um, when it came to if you had the buck, you had the power, you had the influence in society and granted it's still that way. Um, but now when it comes to impact metrics and impact currency, I mean, there's so many more mediums that can either a make you money or give you influence in society so like for instance social media like the impact of social media um, based off of how many followers you have you can get sponsored by a particular company to market their product and now you may have an influence or quote unquote an impact on your on the amount of followers that you have and telling them to buy this specific product so i'm i'm using social media as an example but and now I see that there's more of a blurry line between impact and influence and how that's traded from, uh, how that's shifted for, away from profit. Um, is there any thoughts about that? I don't want to take up all the airtime, so that's why I was leaving it open for a little bit. But my quick two cents is that is such an insightful point because more and more I know that um, large organizations and corporations are thinking about who are the individual influencers and in impact and how do we leverage that you know, platform and the breadth of that platform. And so who are the individuals sitting in these organizations and what does their personal brand look like and how do we tie their personal brand to our identity. So we get known as sort of, so there is a lot of that, but I think there is also noise in sort of separating the marketing elements to the actual impact elements. And that's partly where the impact currency comes in. And I don't think I fully answered your question because I don't really have a good answer for how that plays out in a quantifiable sense, but there's something huge there. And I definitely see that area really, really growing where you have various impact influencers who are organizing and collaborating with others and who really become the, the agents of change to change the perceptions around certain issues. Um, you also mentioned inclusivity and I'm very curious as to what you meant by that because I do know that one thing as big data is being used more and more, um, people are thinking about the data that exists and how biased the data is. And if you're using existing data in art for with artificial intelligence, the outcomes obviously would be biased as well. So how do you get more inclusive data? So I'm curious as to why you, like what you meant by inclusivity. Yeah, um, that's a that's a good point. I mean, when it came to inclusivity, I was thinking more about. I mean, we were having conversations about the youth about youth led initiatives um, and how with the increased role of technology. Um, anyone who has a phone, anyone who has a computer can contribute their voice to the space. So it's like, I don't know if you're d directly contributing to the economy, but if you market yourself right, if you brand yourself right, and if you have enough followers, that may be another source of income and you may have more power over a certain group of people, like power, or impact, or whatever you want to say. Um, so that that's what I meant. Technology has given us the medium to do that. Yeah, I, I mean, think, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go, no, ahead. go ahead, please, please go ahead. I was just going to say that there's a little bit of there's something here where we're talking about influencers and impact influencers and sort of amplifying their voices. And at the same time, we're trying to talk about being more inclusive. And I think that that's a little bit of a of a challenge for a lot of impact organizations that I've that I've seen where they're trying to really amplify the voices of people who are clear innovators, but at the same time, make it something that's accessible to everyone and sort of promote the message that even if you're not 
you know, one of these sort of star innovators that you see it, you know, at every different competition, at every different fellowship, like they sort of circulate between all of the different innovative fellowships and, and it becomes sort of almost this little club. Um, and how to to sort of do that and, and have those voices and have those major players without having it be something that becomes something that only a certain group of people has access to or feels like they can do, right? It should be something that everyone can do. Like you said, anyone with a cell phone should feel empowered to be creative and be innovative. So how do you balance those messages? I think is an interesting challenge. You're right. And I think influence right now, current model influence leads to impact and influence could be gained, whether you buy an ad or, you know, have followers or bots or different things like that. But there's not much design thought and like from a UX UI to an individual and how they can have an impact. The word comes to mind is social media, whatever, someone went viral. Um, and otherwise, but I don't see it as a, from a design standpoint, I think everything you talk about is, oh, you're building a social platform, but then when they say social, they're thinking social media, um, where you're not thinking social impact. Um, and it's a different, different model and from even from a use case and how that goes. And, and that is a bottom up versus a top down. Um, and you have to think individual and how they're you know, the, their sphere and in and, and, and areas of impact that they could be helped them out versus, uh, you know, um, what is my social cause as an organization? So I agree, influence is not necessarily impact. Impact needs to be first. Thank you. One of the most important things that I consider in social impact space is the future of impact is female. It's very important that women are being considered as an important role in Achi in improving social impact. Nowadays, a lot of organizations are doing diversity and inclusion at workplace as a social impact issue. And there's a website called CEO Action for Diversity and Inclusion, where almost 450 CEOs have pledged to promote diversity and inclusion at their workplace. And a lot of initiatives have been mentioned. And one of the, more, one of the most important factors I see is promoting work-life balance. Any points on this? I mean, like, I think that especially when it came to women led initiatives, um, there's so many ways that women have, I mean, over time have um, invested in like the health, the economy, like various sectors um, over and especially the sustainability aspect. I mean, if women are the ones that are culturally or traditionally the ones that are supposed to take care of the children, you're caring for the next generation as well. You're providing the stepping stones for that next generation to quote unquote succeed, to surpass their, uh, their parents. Um, so it's like, if you're investing in the women, if you're allowing, if you're showing that there are more opportunities um, than, than they currently perceive, then they're able to move above and beyond what their what their current environment is telling them. I think absolutely. Oh, this is Divya here. Um, I think with supporting women, um, I'm just at that age where I'm watching, you know, friends of mine have babies and, you know, real questions. They all work across different industries, uh, whether it's nonprofits or their lawyers. Um, and the real question is, like, do they have the support network because they have moved to different locations for universities, to different jobs, they have traveled, and, you know, we all have traveled to different locations, so we don't necessarily live where we were raised. Um, and I think, like, something, I'm not, I don't know if social impact organizations have the capacity at the moment, small ones anyway, of uh, benefits that allow women who uh, have kids and have families to take care of, the ability to balance that in an effective way. Um, there has to be kind of an out-of-the-box solution for that. Uh, something I think about is, like, how do we help women build networks in our situations um, to make that happen at a low cost but high efficiency? Um, I don't know if you guys have ever encountered maybe 
personally who have actually said, I have to take another job that's more steady and put something aside because it is more safe, better, and I need to be home at a certain time. So in my head, I was debating whether or not to share this. And this will go, this goes to show sort of the context that still exists. I actually have three children and uh, I've traveled to different countries to do my job. Um, so this very much resonates with me, this part of the conversation. And, you know, you mentioned small organizations. It's still tough even at corporations. A lot of it is PR. It's on an individual basis. If you really dig into people's stories and their narratives, there was an article in the New Yorker that spoke to this in order to really understand sort of women's issues, you have to uh, kind of dig into female feminist wisdom over time and really understand women's stories. So it goes back to sort of narratives, revealing what's actually happening because it's not just, it's not just one job you give up, it's sort of this uh, invisible labor and the amount of sort of you put in over a lifetime and how that plays out. And there is some value to be captured there and as well as value that was mentioned earlier about how women are you know, basically making a more sustainable um, society. And I think that was really insightful. I've never quite heard it put quite, you know, that way. So there's a lot of uncaptured value. And all I was really trying to say is that even corporates are still struggling with it. And it is a huge issue. Work-life balance, um, giving women the same opportunities, a lot of it's perception. You won't even get offered the same types of sort of jobs and opportunities, especially if it requires travel, because people will assume you can't do it. So there's just a lot going on there. And I've I've had to sort of put a lot aside. Happy to talk offline with anybody who wants to about that. I would actually love to hear also from the like the males here about this. <laughs> So, Shivani, you heard my story about how I started Nushtube. It was about a uh, grandma, a matriarch, that basically Christmas dinner, we ate her food, and it was awesome, all these guests. And at the end, she was the last royal chef to the king of Afghanistan. So basically seeing her and her daughter, this could be a way if they want to go ahead and share those recipes while being able to earn an income. Um, there's, there's things in New York for women that have these kind of a pop-up kitchen events and kind of share their culture and history and also their food. Um, this, this whole gig economy, which you hear about cloud kitchens and, and these other things that are popping up where um, uh, basically Uber Eats and stuff wants to follow where a homemaker could go ahead and share their food and kitchen out. There's a lot of these first and second generations, including my family, of these matriarchs and patriarchs that have these histories and, and there's a way to economize that. Um, outside, I kind of have to, you know, drive an Uber or whatever else. And my wife was furloughed recently in this whole, uh, you know, latest uh, government shutdown. And a lot of folks are looking for alternatives as having something that they can contribute. And I think, you know, your food and kitchen and history and recipes have a way to do that too from our enablement. So I guess from uh, from my perspective uh, in the work that I do, we. Um, our work is financed by the State Department, so they have a, uh, they're keen on trying to ensure that we have gender equity in the programs that we do, whether they be with training entrepreneurs or working with investors. And uh, one thing that we've noticed is actually really like, it's really interesting and it's, um, it's encouraging is that in a lot of contexts, even though we um, are pushing for it on the personal level of wanting to achieve that, we're seeing a shift in the non-impact just general venture angel investment space in that people are realizing how much purchasing power and control women have in general. And because of that, they're more keen on not, not only investing in women-led startups or startups that are focused on women, but also bringing in more women investors, VCs, partners. Um, and even though it's still early, and I think if you look at the percentage breakdown, it still looks pretty bad. The idea that um, on top of an impact, there's also the, um, I guess, like the economic benefit that, that people who don't necessarily care about impact are still incentivized to, um, at the very least, consider um, a lot of these issues that we're bringing up and then invest in women as well. So that's something that's promising that I've seen. That's something you, that's a really interesting point that you brought up. Like the economics can very much blur with the impact in certain ways and you can't ignore it. And uh, 
something that I was very much that I was thinking about or something that I always say is like use the system to change the system. So it's like if there are current assumptions or there are current standards that like um like for instance like like that that image of a woman working in a kitchen and caring for her kids that's been that's been like um like more and more of a cultural norm i mean it's i mean it's not like as much of a cultural norm as it was in the, in, in the past but it's still i mean especially in my culture in indian culture it's still a cultural norm for us um and what's interesting is like you can say that okay you can push that aside and you can um, be an outlier and not care, not have children and not be in the kitchen and um, you can do all of those things. But on the other hand, you can also like use that same thing that is supposed to squash your power and still be able to show that, no, there's a lot of power that is coming from your assumptions that you're making right now. And uh, there's a lot of power. Like, my my cousin was actually just thinking about um, she's she was just talking about how she was being innovative in the kitchen and where um, her uh, like they had like some strawberry juice or something that was left over um, after a meal that they had and then they froze it and then made popsicles out of it so it's like there are little moments of empowerment or innovation that you can find anywhere it's just that people don't characterize them as such and people don't think that they're disruptive as such so they kind of cast them aside. But even if you use like these assumptions to not bog you down, but rise above it, that there's a lot of power in that, but just, it's just the narrative. I think what Samira was talking about, like the narrative is what needs to be changed. Um, so we are <laughs> gonna wrap up, but um, yeah, are there any last thoughts before um, we sign off for the night? Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> all right. Um, so we're going to close, but thank you all for being here. Um, it was really great talking to you, and we will see you for the next session. Have a great one.